I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, give this presentation on um, ketone bodies in the brain and their use in neuroketo therapeutics. I'm going to try to give some of the rationale for uh, why neuroketo therapeutics may be uh, useful in Alzheimer's disease and by extension, its frequent syndromic precursor, mild cognitive impairment. We've certainly recognized for several decades since the 1980s that glucose utilization is uh, reduced in Alzheimer's disease. And we know this through studies of fluorodeoxyglucose PET uh, studies in which individuals are given an injection of a radio labeled sugar, which distributes throughout the brain. Um, and you can see here that in certain parts of the brain here posteriorly, it's like the lights have gone out. And uh, one of my first uh, research um, projects in the Alzheimer's field was, was trying to understand uh, why glucose utilization uh, begins to decline in um, brains of Alzheimer's uh, disease as demonstrated on fluorodeoxyglucose PET scans. Here's a picture of me uh, in 1987 in um, that laboratory at New York University. The way we uh, did those studies was to take brains from individuals who had just passed away uh, with Alzheimer's or without Alzheimer's, and we would homogenize uh, the brains and we would add the homogenates to a sealed chamber uh, to which you would add a radio labeled glucose, which would be metabolized by the enzymes in the homogenate pyruvate. And then that pyruvate would enter the mitochondria and enter the Krebs cycle. Uh, and that carbon would be released as carbon dioxide, which would be captured in a bowl here in the sealed chamber. And we can then count how much of the radioactive carbon dioxide was released. And what we saw was that brain homogenates, homogenates from um, young control individuals had a relatively robust rate of glucose utilization. Uh, brains from um, older individuals who were cognitively normal had a somewhat lower rate of glucose utilization. And um, brain homogenates from uh, those with Alzheimer's disease uh, showed a much lower rate of glucose utilization. So basically, we uh, were able to corroborate what the FDG PET scans were showing. And it appeared that the, this problem with glucose utilization uh, has to do with the brain tissue itself. One thing we considered is whether uh, the brain might be able to utilize an alternative fuel other than glucose. And of course, in the brain, the main alternative uh, fuel are ketone bodies like beta-hydroxybutyrate. So we repeated this, this brain homogenate experiment by adding beta-hydroxybutyrate to the homogenates. And the beta-hydroxybutyrate would enter the mitochondria, interact with the Krebs cycle, radio-labeled carbon dioxide would be released, and we were able to quantify the amount of radioactive carbon dioxide that accumulated. And what we saw was that um, beta-hydroxybutyrate utilization rates uh, essentially recapitulated those for glucose. So the uh, amount of beta-hydroxybutyrate utilized, the rate of utilization was similar to that of glucose for the control brains and for the uh, Alzheimer's brains as well. And uh, for those who remember their uh, biochemistry class, where glucose utilization and ketone body utilization pathways overlap is in the mitochondria, which suggested to us at the time perhaps there was a problem with mitochondria in Alzheimer's disease, and uh, this has subsequently uh, been borne out. And uh, around that time, we uh, actually proposed uh, using ketone bodies to augment glucose utilization, actually try and treat people with Alzheimer's disease. And this is uh, from an abstract that we published in 1989, in which we proposed that ketone bodies may serve as a potential alternate metabolic substrate in Alzheimer's disease. Well, certainly the idea of therapeutic ketosis is not a new idea. We see references to this um, all the way back in ancient Greece. Uh, Hippo Hippocrates wrote that um, fits or, or seizures could be treated with fasting, and fasting, of course, if done long enough and rigorously enough, uh, will induce ketosis. It's referred to um, also in, in the Bible, in the book of Matthew. Epileptic seizures were felt to reflect demonic possession, and if you um, fasted and starved out the demons, then, then you wouldn't be uh, shaking anymore. 
anymore. Um, in the 20th century, an alternative to fasting was developed to mimic fasting, and that was a ketogenic diet in which individuals dramatically reduce their carbohydrate intake and dramatically increase their fat intake. And this um, actually manages to mimic fasting and induce ketosis. This um, slide just reviews the, uh, the biochemical pathways that are involved in this, um, not to belabor it, but um, if you fast or you're on a ketogenic diet, uh, you're not eating carbohydrates, insulin levels drop dramatically. And when insulin levels drop, um, you begin to mobilize fat that's stored in your, your adipose. And that fat will uh, go to the liver, uh, fatty acids will enter the mitochondria and undergo fatty acid oxidation to generate ketone bodies, which are released into the blood, traverse the blood, and are taken up by other tissues such as the brain where the ketone bodies then enter the mitochondria, interact with the Krebs cycle, and are used to generate high energy electrons that can feed oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain. It actually took me several years to complete a, uh, a study of um, a ketogenic diet intervention in people with Alzheimer's disease. This trial was called the Ketogenic Diet Retention and Feasibility Trial, or KDRAFT. Um, it it was an exploratory study in which we enrolled 15 individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Participants were maintained for three months on a ketogenic diet supplemented by uh, a medium chain triglyceride. They performed uh, self-monitoring for ketosis using urine ketone strips. And they had cognitive testing before they initiated the diet, after three months on the diet, and after one month of the diet washout. This figure here shows the uh, the flow of the study. And I'll just mention that uh, it took us quite a while to recruit our 15 participants, um, almost two years. And we had to uh, pre-screen uh, close to 300 individuals to get our 15 participants. Targeted macronutrient composition was 70% energy is fat. Uh, and this included um, fat taken in through medium chain triglycerides. Um, and carbs were restricted to less than 10% of energy. So this was actually a fairly liberal ketogenic diet. Um, we, we didn't use the most rigorous uh, versions of the ketogenic diet. The medium chain triglyceride that we use was a combination of C8 and C10 fatty acids, uh, not the, um, the MCT that you're gonna hear about later from from Dr. Kunain. The patients were able to tolerate some uh, medium chain triglyceride, uh, one and a half to three tablespoons a day, which actually fell short of the targeted volume, but uh, it was getting up there. And uh, the participants also uh, took a daily uh, vitamin supplement. I had uh, anticipated that participants who are most demented would have the easiest time on the diet since they would most likely simply eat what their caregivers gave them. Uh, like so many things, I was wrong. The uh, Those who, who had the more advanced Alzheimer's disease were unable to uh, maintain the diet uh, in retrospect because the caregivers were so already so overburdened by caring for them that they were not able to initiate and maintain the diet. Those participants who had very mild Alzheimer's disease defined by a clinical dementia rating scale or CDR scale. Uh, scale of 0 0.5 tolerated uh, or were able to maintain the diagnosis fairly well, as were those with mild Alzheimer's disease, those with CDR scores of one. There was one participant who um, who adhered to the diet, but was protocol non, but did not adhere to the uh, protocol in that he canceled his, um, he stopped taking his Alzheimer's medications, his Dinepazil and his Memantine, but uh, nevertheless, we include him here in um, the data analysis. In terms of anthropometrics, the diet really didn't change the, the weights or the body mass index of the participants. Cholesterol levels trended up, but were not significantly increased, not, certainly not from a statistical standpoint. Uh, insulin levels um, and glucose levels did not change. Really, the one thing that changed was what the participants were eating. So they increased their fat intake and decreased their carbohydrate intake to within the, uh, the target levels that we had specified. This shows uh, the amount of time spent in ketosis as ascertained by uh, people's daily urine uh, keto sticks. And of the, the, uh, the 10 individuals who adhered to the diet, all of them at some point reached ketosis. It was often uh, fairly a low level trace ketosis. Some people reached higher levels of ketosis. If you average all of this together, those in the study reached ketosis on average about 61 uh, uh, about 60% of the days. This shows the, uh, the serum levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate that we measured. And you can see here that, things, that the beta-hydroxybutyrate levels in the serum start out low, 
and then one month after uh, the diet is initiated, the uh, levels rise, and then they kind of become steady in months two and three before, uh, in general, washing out, at least in those who, who stop the diet as, as they were supposed to do. This shows the average um, serum beta-hydroxybutyrate levels, uh, an initial uh, robust increase, and then um, these increases here at months two and three before um, washing back out to uh, baseline levels. These are the cognitive data for the protocol non-inherent participant who stopped his Alzheimer's medications. He actually showed a decline in cognition over the three months. There was one participant whose cognition neither improved nor declined over the three months. The other eight individuals, whether they were um, very mild or mild Alzheimer's disease, appeared to show improvements in, um, in cognitive performance demonstrated on a cognitive scale called the ADIS cog or the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale. Just to give you some perspective, uh, an improvement of about six points or more is really an improvement that you can see from across the room. This caption um, breaks out a little bit more about what we saw in terms of the cognitive testing from testing session to session. And I'll show you that, that uh, yeah, here's the, the one individual who was protocol non-compliant, but for the protocol compliant individuals who maintain the diet, you tended to see their cognitive scores improve over the first three months while they were on the diet and then revert back to baseline uh, after the washout. This puts a numeric spin on the um, cognitive testing. So um, for all participants, there was about a four point improvement on the ADIS cog. If you leave out the protocol non-compliant individuals, about five points. The, the MMSE improved by about a point. And just to, again, to give some perspective, the amount of change on the ADIS cog that's seen over about three months trials with cholinesterase inhibitors is more around two points. So uh, an improvement of about four points is what um, was to us anyway um, quite encouraging. Well, the question comes up as to what exactly is ketosis or, um, or a ketogenic diet doing to the brain on a molecular level? And a lot of groups have, have, have looked at this question. Um, we're still not sure exactly how a ketogenic diet affects molecular pathways in the brain. One limitation to this is that the brain in many of these studies is considered as a single organ, but it's not really homogeneous um, in terms of being a tissue. It consists of neurons and, and glial cells, and these cells are, are quite different from a metabolic perspective, from an energy metabolism perspective. So to try and get uh, more insight into this, we uh, performed a study in mice in which we placed mice on a ketogenic diet for three months, and then we performed RNA-seq. We, we looked at how the diet was changing their RNA transcriptome um, to look for, for changes in molecular pathways. Now, the, the mice on the ketogenic diet, they generated ketosis. Their blood glucose levels uh, declined over their three months on the diet. They um, avoided the weight gain that was seen in the mice on the chow diet. Both groups, those on the chow and on the ketogenic diet, uh, both consumed equal amounts of, of calories. This is a keg pathway analysis of the RNA-seq data, and what it's looking for is changes in molecular pathways that are, uh, that are identified by a computer software looking for changes in patterns of gene expression, of RNA gene expression changes. And uh, we indeed found that neurons and astrocytes respond quite differently uh, to a ketogenic diet. So for example, insulin signaling pathway in neurons was dramatically upregulated, uh, which we suspect indicates the need for neurons to want to increase glucose utilization in the face of decreased glucose delivery. Whereas uh, in the astrocytes, um, the astrocytes actually downregulated their insulin signaling pathway and we wonder if this is, represents an attempt to um, prevent glucose utilization by the neurons. And importantly, we saw this um, robust increase in gene expression in, or expression of genes that support oxidative phosphorylation. So the neurons are trying to upregulate um, oxidative phosphorylation. This type of um, mathematical analysis also lends itself to looking for um, changes uh, connect to different disease states. So uh, we found that um, mice on the ketogenic diet activated, uh, altered uh, molecular pathways that are changed in Alzheimer's disease. So, um, and this was primarily being driven by changes in oxidative phosphorylation gene expression. So specifically in Alzheimer's disease, oxidative phosphorylation gene expression goes down in a ketogenic diet. 
oxidative phosphorylation gene expression goes up. And for that reason, Alzheimer's disease was the top uh, disease that, or uh, as being connected to a ketogenic diet. This all raises, again, further questions as to how a ketogenic diet affects molecular physiology. And I've gone over the obvious um, point that um, there are bioenergetic effects, but just by putting carbon uh, into the mitochondria in the Krebs cycle, we also shift neurotransmitter balances. By changing fundamental mitochondrial physiology and how uh, cells respond to that physiology, we may be reducing oxidative stress, ketone bodies, and, and um, acetyl groups in general that are produced from ketone bodies uh, can modify histones and DNA and, and thereby alter gene expression. Uh, so that's an important change to consider. And there are, also, um, there are also receptors in neurons that recognize ketone bodies um, and activating some of those receptors may actually um, lead to decreases in inflammation. There are actually other studies that um, that show the effects of a ketogenic diet in those with mild cognitive impairment. The first is a study of Krikorian et al., which randomized uh, participants to a low carbohydrate or a high carbohydrate diet. Those on the low carbohydrate diet showed improvements um, in a memory uh, score, um, and improvements in this memory score correlated with urine ketones. Uh, the study of Brandt et al studied uh, a collection of individuals with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease, randomizing them to either a modified Atkins diet, which generated ketones, to uh, a heart-healthy diet. And after six months, those on the uh, ketogenic diet who had ketones uh, showed memory score improvements. And finally, the study of Neth et al., which randomized those with subjective cognitive impairment and mild cognitive impairment to um, initially a mild, a mo modified Mediterranean ketogenic diet or a heart healthy diet, kept them on that diet for six weeks and then crossed them over to the other diet. They found that um, spinal fluid, beta amyloid, and tau levels changed in directions opposite to those that occur in the, in the natural Alzheimer's state, which was taken as, as a potentially good sign. And also there were increases in cerebral perfusion observed in those on the ketogenic diet, which was taken as a good sign. So just to conclude, there was a strong rationale for using neuroketo therapeutics in Alzheimer's disease and by its extension, and, and by extension in its syndromic precursor, mild cognitive impairment. These trials that, that make this point are exploratory and we need more trials, um, bigger trials, but um, we do know that um, people generally don't like to uh, change their diets, so uh, alternative approaches to generating ketone bodies are are certainly um, important and important to look at. And uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the many individuals, institutions, and uh, lines of support that made this work possible. Thank you very much.